Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. And today we're going to do both an announcement and an edit. As you can see I'm quickly editing the meeting drag section of the website and I'm putting up a new event. So if you'd like to tour Portsmouth Dockyard, specifically HMS Warrior and HMS Victory and maybe if we have time Mary Rose as well, I'm going to organize a group tour session. So using the events edition section to this particular portion of the website, you can see it's nicely formatted, very easily change the dates, put in a bit of description and a little bit more description there. I'll probably put in a Google Maps link or something for people who are unfamiliar at some point in the next week or so. And then it's just a case of deciding what kind of picture I want to go with it. So remove that one, upload one of mine of Warrior. And then as you can see, because of the grid system, I can very easily move everything over to expand the picture whilst keeping everything in format. And then it's just a quick edit of this button, put in the relevant email address. And now if you want to meet me and go around at least two, possibly three ships, all you have to do is go to the website and click that button. Easy done. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes, but you never know, you might want to do it for some other reason, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash Drakinafel. You can get a free trial. And once you're ready, that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video and on with the main show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another video. This week, we have a very special guest returning. Hopefully, you know, most of you will recognize him by now. Uh, the great John Parshall, who I have no idea where he is on my screen relative to me at the moment because we're, we're in minimized mode. Um, but we are going to get an extra special taste of things because for those of you who've been keeping up with progress on underwater archaeology, as of the time of recording, probably as of the time of release, about, what, six, eight weeks ago now? They, uh, um, a little it, less, uh, but yeah, about less? four, okay. yeah, I think. Four weeks ago, wow. Okay. Oh yeah, of course, because it was just at the start of my US trip. So yeah, let, about around about a month ago, they uh, went out and dropped an ROV down on three of the wrecks from the Battle of Midway, and that this footage is now available to us to peruse. So we're going to have a look through a Kargi, Karga, and Yorktown, or what's left of them, and of course, the man who co-authored Shattered Sword <laughs> is going to tell us. How much of these ships are left and what exactly we're looking at? So if you didn't watch the live streams of the uh, the dive at the beginning of September, this is your opportunity to get a front row seat on what the current state of underwater archaeology is as far as uh, World War II ships go. So I guess, shall we start playing? Yeah, sounds good. Let's do it. So we're starting off with Akagi. Yeah, uh, I'm guessing this is the ship's bow. <laughs> Actually, no. Um, mm -hmm. and, and maybe scroll forward just a little bit because mm -hmm. uh, basically what ended up happening is they uh, they dropped the ROV down, landed uh, pretty close to the starboard side of the ship, and it took us a little while to figure out exactly where we were relative to the ship. And uh, but eventually we get a glimpse. There we go. Freeze it right here. Yeah, that's good. Right there. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is one of Akagi's 120 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft guns. This is on the starboard side of the ship. And if you'll allow me to share my screen, mm -hmm. what we're looking at here, and this is, you know, an annotated, uh, I'm putting my drawings uh, side by side with, with uh, pieces of the actual footage. You can tell that we're looking at one of these two gun tubs because you can see this little indentation of the flight deck here uh, that you can mm -hmm. see with this little orange line. And so this is one of the two mounts. I forget which one uh, that's that's right behind Akagi's funnel. And what's interesting here is, well, first of all, you can see that the, the guns themselves have fallen off the pedestal mount that was here in the tub. But even more interesting is the fact that these mounts used to be covered with um, green shields. And you can see them down here in the drawing here. So the, the thing was fully enclosed with a light sheet metal shield 
that was designed to protect the gun crew from the flu gases from the funnel. And we don't see any evidence of those shields here. And I'm, I'm actually involved in a, in a little debate uh, with a guy named Ed Lowe, who's very, very good at, at Japanese ship identification. Uh, he maintains that what's going on here is that these shields have just disintegrated, rusted away, and they're, you know, there's just no evidence left of them. I, I've, I don't know about that. I, one of the things that I'm really intrigued about is the fact that you can look here and the lip of this gun tub is just so clean. Um, you know, it, it would seem to me that if those shields had decayed, that there would be at least some vestiges or traces of them left in that we would be able to see in some form. Um, and instead we got nothing here. So I don't know what happened. You know, maybe the shields did decay and fall away. Or is it possible that they were maybe intentionally removed in a in a dockyard refit right before the battle or, you know, a year or so or a few months? I don't know. Um, but it was it was fascinating to me to be able to look at these particular gun tubs and not see any vestiges of, of those gun shields. So. Yeah, you, as you say, if they had rusted away, you'd expect there to be little fragments and bits lying on the on the pedestal yeah something like that uh something collapsed against uh you know the gun mount or, or something yeah and and like i say there there's, doesn't seem to be much evidence of them at all and that was also the case we saw two of these tubs i believe and they they both looked reasonably the same so anyway mm. all right so i'll stop my share here i should um you know let's see let's uh let's actually go back a little bit just as sort of some of the backstory on this expedition, I, I had signed up for a, a scientist account um, on this expedition. This is being run by the National Oceanographic and uh, Aeronautical Administration, NOAA. And they sent a ship out called the Nautilus. And they have an ROV that's capable of getting down to these depths, which is to say, you know, 6,000 meters or so. But this was not their A-team ROV. Uh, and it doesn't have all the fancy laser range finders and all that stuff uh, that they wanted to have. But it did have a camera that was capable of, of generating 4K footage and then broadcasting it live from the ship back to the control room in Maryland, where a lot of the expedition team was located. They got the ROV down onto Akagi and they started going around and they, you know, some of the commentary that was coming back on their live stream was, uh, I, I don't want to badmouth anybody. Uh, I'll just say that some of it was making me wince a little bit because it was incorrect. <laughs> and so I ended up texting a buddy of mine who was, I knew there in the control room and he was like, are you watching this? I'm like, of course I'm watching this. <laughs> and uh, he was like, well, let, let me, you know, hold on a sec. Let me get you on the phone. And, you know, Next thing I know, I'm talking to somebody at NOAA and they sort of do their magic. And now all of a sudden, from my study here in Minneapolis, I'm piped in directly to the, the command chat stream that's going to the ship and also to shore. And so as we're going around this ship, um, you know, I'm, I'm taking screen caps of, of my drawings. I'm saying we're here. We're here. We're here. It was incredibly incredibly cool it was honestly one of the highlights of my career um because the further backstory I, sh I shared this on another podcast is that akagi is actually the source of one of the the few really bad arguments in my marriage um <laughs> back in <laughs> back in 1999 when the initial chunk of junk from kaga was found down on the bottom by nauticos and it was the discovery of that particular artifact that really is the genesis for Shattered Sword. I mean, because Tony and I were involved in that expedition, you know, we were kind of like, you know, nobody's ever written a, a book about the Japanese side of this battle. Anyway, they were going to go back out there with another expedition and take a look for the ships themselves. And they wanted me to come along. This is 1999. And unfortunately, what that meant is I'm going to have to take a, a month and a half of unpaid leave for my job and go out and sit on a ship for that time we had a four-year-old and a two-year-old the two-year-old was about to get diagnosed with autism okay and my wife quite rightly was like 
this seems very ill-advised, you know, you should not do this. <laughs> and I was, you know, dead set on it because, yeah, but, but this is a Kagi, you know, I gotta go, <laughs> honey. Fortunately, you know, the expedition fell through. Um, so, it, you know, fast forward now 24 years, it was just so incredibly cool for me to be sitting in my study and, you know, the footage is being piped in real time in high def. And I literally went and popped popcorn, you know, as we're going <laughs> around the ship. And the only, you know, wife brownie points that I burned was, well, yeah, OK, I stayed up till four in the morning that night. But, you know, I didn't have to go and sit on a ship. So anyway, technology is cool. That's that's the bottom line. And it was really, really fun to be able to go around this ship and, and see all this stuff. All right. Enough backstory. Yeah. Sorry blathering <laughs> is that right yeah that is, all right it's, it's, yeah let's go forward here yeah all right so basically they put the rov down and they started yeah this is kind of cool and they started driving around the ship towards the bow and mm -hmm. yeah go ahead and freeze it here let me show you what we're looking at this is uh i'll just go big picture here let's take a look at my file browser Okay, so we were just over here, and now we move forward. The funnel is completely gone, unfortunately, which is a bummer because that was, you know, one of the really kind of standout aspects of Akagi. What we're looking at right now is this section right up here, which is uh, you've got a couple of uh, double 25 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, some, some fire control stuff, and we're also going to be able to see the lip of the elevator. So now let me find you a screen cap. It shows us where we is. And of course, it is also hidden by the thumbnails. Up, mm -hmm. up. Yeah, right? Yeah, here we go. All right. So what we're looking at, we can barely see the outline of one of these Type 96 uh, dual mounts here. And we're also, we're going to be able to see the uh, the curvature of the, the forward elevator, uh, which is mostly blown away. And we're also taking a look at one of her arresting gear arrays, which is right here. It's the very forward most arresting cable. that's right in front of her elevator. Uh -huh. so now it's, yeah. So let me, let me stop sharing and let's go back to that footage. Right. So you mm -hmm. can, you can see that type 96 mount, uh, there and, that arresting gear array and then up in the upper left corner again yeah and here we are bouncing up and down on the 20 foot pogo stick as as the ship yeah. moves up and down but you can see all of those features so what this tells us is that akagi's damage um is pretty bad but she still has portions of her uh upper hangar deck sections reasonably intact i mean these gun tubs are on the upper hangar deck level and they're still there um we're looking here at a distorted piece of her flight deck um you know the planking is long gone but we you know we can see the the metal um stuff that would have been holding up the planking as well if you drive they did drive an rov later on in the process they went right mm -hmm. down the center line of the ship looking down the whole middle of the hangar is just gone right so basically, Akagi has been reduced to this kind of bathtub sort of structure where the interior of the hangar is just, you know, all blown away and, and gone. But the exterior, the rim of the bathtub where all the gun tubs were and all that stuff, that's still mostly there. Yeah, you so, can see it's all been so. bent up here from yeah, some kind of internal sure. explosion. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, I mean, obviously, a, man, a manned submarine probably wouldn't have the bouncy problem, but at the same time, it's... Uh, I can't imagine the insurance premiums nowadays on man subs going that deep compared to an ROV. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, Kaga and Akagi are considerably deeper than even Titanic. I mean, Titanic's at like, what, 12,000? We're down near, damn near 18,000 feet. So here's a nice shot of that, uh, that arresting gear. And this was, this is one of those moments that for me was just really cool in that, you know, I've spent a lot of time looking at drawings of Akagi. And, you know, even in the geekiest of the geek books, you don't necessarily see detailed drawings of what the, the arresting gear 
uh, looked like. And, you know, we're looking down into the box that held the tensioning elements for the cables and all that stuff. It's, it's really one of those, you know, sort of wow kind of moments, you know, you're, you're looking at a, at a really detailed portion of the ship and it's recognizable what it is. Anyway, nerd alert, right? <laughs> <laughs> Well, so okay. this is one of the things, isn't it? You've always got the, the various people debating over what what exactly not only did the ship have, but what exact state was it in when the yeah. ship left port on that day? Because uh, ships are forever right. undergoing minor maintenance and changes yeah. and so forth. And then you get to see something like this. You're like, ah, well, mm -hmm. it's pretty undeniable at this point. Yeah. yeah this is a little bit further forward. And uh, as we're making our way towards the bow, I'm not exactly sure where we are. Uh, at this point but yeah if you want to drag your cursor forward and it's uh because we're, we're going to start getting to the bow here pretty soon okay this is cool stop right here and okay, once we get back up I, it, let it bob up a little bit there we go all right so we are now in the uh the sort of the forward this is the forward bulkhead of Akagi's hangar decks. So let me find where we are at. Doop, 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 doop. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So what we've got here is the the forward bulkhead for her hangers, and this is probably the upper hangar deck right here. And so that's this section of the ship. This particular little circle right here is the landing that is on this stairway that goes up the front of that bulkhead to both the lower hangar deck and the upper hangar deck. And what makes this so cool for me is that one of the chapters in Shattered Sword talking about the damage control uh, on the, the ships is, is entitled up the steel steps where I'm talking about Akagi's crewmen, um, you know, snaking their hoses up this very stairway to go up to the hangar decks to try to fight the fires. At this point in time, he had rigged a hand powered pump on the foxhole of the ship. And so there's a gang of men right here, you know, with that pump, you know, keeping the water pressure going as they're trying to, keep their garden hoses you know <laughs> under pressure trying to fight this raging av gas fire that's that's taking place in the hangars just you know amidships and of course it's it's a futile effort but again that image of of these men going up this stairway right there up to in many cases their deaths you know in the course of that firefighting exercise there are continuing induced explosions and people passing out because of fumes and you know you name it um but again it's one of those things where you know my god there were we know the things that were happening on the bow of this ship and they were happening right here uh the other thing you can see is this is the base of this uh support that goes up and holds the flight deck up in the forward part of the ship and then, of course, too, we can see the bollard here that would have been used to tie the ship up uh, at dockside. There they are right down there. So, the, again, just, just a really cool view of, of this portion of the ship and really gives us some nice, some nice details. Yeah, and you can even see the, sort of the, uh, the holes in some of the, the deck plating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool. As we're making our way towards the bow. Okay. All right. Yeah, here we are. So one of the things that makes a a Akagi so cool to me is the fact that she's built on a battle cruiser hull. And from the side scan images that came out in 2019 when RV, you know, when Petrol found this ship initially, it was funny. As soon as I saw the side scan uh, images, you know, I knew immediately this was a Kagi. And 
and I was having a debate. It was actually Tony. He was just throwing out, you know, could this be sore you? And I'm like, dude, I've spent so long looking at this ship. I, I, I forget exactly what I said, but it's like, I, I would recognize Akagi's um, lines, like the way I would recognize an ex-girlfriend. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. obvious what this ship is. And one of the things that makes it so obvious is the incredibly lean, long, slender bow that she has, which is in perfect view uh, right here on the, on the screen. You can see how slender uh, the particular the, the lines are for her. So let me go ahead and let's let's find uh, a view of her. Yeah, here we go. All right. So here we are again, looking at at her her bollard where she would be tied off. We can see uh, the two holes here through the through the deck where the anchor chains are going to be going down to the anchors, and we'll see more of those anchor chains later. And then there's th- this, which is, I- I'm not exactly sure what this is, I'm sorry, and I- I'll be beaten up uh, mm. for that lack of knowledge by the, by the nerdorati on there. But again, <laughs> this particular feature is just very clear on her drawings. You know, we know exactly where we are. And we know exactly what ship this is. This is a Kagi. Yeah, thanks to the Great Canto Earthquake, there is only one Amagi class battle cruiser <laughs> hull yeah. floating around. Or yeah, not exactly, floating around at exactly. the moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and that's you know the other thing that makes this footage so amazing. This ship has not been seen in 81 years. You know, this is the the first glimpse that we've got of her on the bottom here. And she is really in fairly fairly good condition all things considered you can see down on the bottom that her crest is sort of starting to come into view as well and there's mm-hmm. there's footage of that later on they went back and and went right right down in front of it um and so we'll see that later on but what makes that cool is the fact that you can still see portions of the imperial chrysanthemum that gold chrysanthemum okay freeze right here this is really neat all right. So what we got here is a chunk of junk that has fallen off the port side. Uh, it's right next to the bow, just on the port side of the ship. And it isn't immediately recognizable, but since you happen to have with you a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right. So there's our chunk of junk, right? We're right there. And now if I can find... Yeah. All right. So what we're looking at here is sort of the collapsed remains of one of these flight deck supports that held the flight deck up. And what makes this so intriguing is the fact that it lands so close to the ship, which says that it was still attached to the ship when it left the surface. Right. So this thing falls through the water column. It hits the bottom at probably about, you know, 30, 35 miles an hour or something like that. That's that's what the, you know, the, the underwater people are telling me. And then as a result of that impact, this stuff falls off and lands right next to the ship. And the fact that it is so close to the ship says that, yeah, it was attached. So, again, really, really cool and tells us something about the way that Akagi was on the surface at the time of her sinking Namely, that her forward flight deck was probably still intact at that time because it's right close to the ship. And then also we're weakened by fire and not designed really for that kind of vertical impact. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Now that looks like the bow. Yeah, we're coming in on the bow there. Yep, there's her chrysanthemum. And you can probably zoom forward. I think they... I did a, a pretty good job of. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Isn't that nice? Right, <laughs> boom. Still got some of its gilding. Yes. Yeah, and that was that was pretty haunting. I gotta say, you know, to see that and recognize that there's still some of the gold paint left on it. You, in some of the close-up shots, you can actually see the individual tracery of the petals of the chrysanthemum itself pretty darn cool and again uh instantly recognizable to anybody who's spent way too much time staring at drawings <laughs> of this ship 
I must be looking at this. There's part of me just going, I really hope this movement is now using the, the zoom on the camera because I would not want yes. to be the one in charge of a presumably multi million dollar drone this close to the yeah. bow. Yeah. No, they were they were definitely zooming in at this point. And it was fascinating uh, to me just to sort of watch how the expedition team members, you know, the ROV drivers and all that, you know, how they go about their business. And they are extremely careful. Uh, you know, they don't want to be anywhere near where there might be like some of those radio aerials, for instance. You know, if those things had draped down by the side of the ship, they don't want to be anywhere near that because if it gets tangled up with the the cable that is commanding mm -hmm. this whole thing, you know, we're verschnooked, you know, <laughs> the, the yeah. ROV dies. We don't want that. So, yeah, they were very, very delicate about how they would move in and move out. Anyway, yeah, this is a super cool um, shot of her, again, her chrysanthemum. And you can, you say you can, you can see, see the petaling. Yeah. Isn't that neat? I mean, the thing that fascinates me is that, you know, okay, these wrecks are, what, another 30 years younger than Titanic. But then at the same time, we're seeing them at yeah. a time that's probably approximately similar between when they sank and when we're seeing them to when Titanic sank and when it was first seen. Right. Good um, point. But, you know, the, the difference in the sea conditions, you know, apart from, you know, okay, we've seen some of the damage further back, but when, if you were just looking at the bow now, you, you if, if that was up on the surface, you'd be like, oh yeah, you know, a little bit of a sandblasting and a scrap and a, uh, Coat paint right. and you'd be, be good. Whereas you yeah. look even at when Ballard first found Titanic, it was immediately obvious that this was a ship in the middle of a prolonged disintegration. Right. Right. So these one these ones might be around a bit longer. Right. All right. Let's uh let's jet ahead here because we're gonna all right. Mm -hmm. This is kind of cool because you can see some of the anchor chains, you know, lying on oh, the yeah. deck. Yeah, right. And down in the, the lower part of your screen, you're also looking down in right down into the top of one of those flight deck supports. That's her port mm -hmm. forward one. Yeah. So again, pretty cool. You can see the mud line is pretty close. Uh, so when she smacks in, and she did sink bow first, so mm -hmm. her bow is buried pretty deeply in the mud, but still very recognizable. All right, here we go. Freeze it right here. We are now halfway up uh the side of the ship on the port side and mm -hmm. i will go ahead and let's see here so let's call up our handy dandy akagi so they you know they drove around looked at the bow and then they drove around here as far as i know uh we did not see any evidence of this port forward um any aircraft gun tub section it may still be there they just may have missed it i don't know didn't see it but where we are now is we're in this section and we're starting to look over towards uh, the bow of the ship, or excuse me, the bridge of the ship. Mm -hmm. And let's see here if I can find what I want to find. Do -do 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 -do. Yeah. yeah, this puppy. Okay. So this little circular feature here used to be, I, someone's going to bust my chops for this. I believe this is a type. 89 gun director for uh akagi's 120 millimeter anti-aircraft gun so this is this is the director that would command these these three guns that are that are just abaft the bridge and so back to that debate with ed Lowe regarding uh the, the gun shields you know what the hell happened to the gun shields on the tubs over on the starboard side of the ship as he points out well okay Here's where that gun director used to be, John. Where is the gun shield for that thing? It's completely gone, too. You know, they didn't take that off. So, yeah, yeah, I don't know. You know, but very clearly we can see the uh, the the circular outline of the tub. And then just above it right here, we have this little bandstand that is sitting right in front of the bridge. That held spotting binoculars, uh, air search implements for anti-aircraft defense. Uh, and also some light machine guns uh, later on, too, that I don't have on my drawing. You'll notice, too, that right in front of that bandstand was the director that controlled the 8-inch casemate guns that are down near the waterline at the stern of the ship. And we're going to see those a little bit later. 
Um, you can't see that here because the director was actually ripped off the deck, but just before this section of footage, you could actually see the the elliptical uh, or the circular mount base for where that director had been. But anyway, we are we are now looking at uh, Akagi's bridge. You can just barely see here some of the tracery of the the portholes. What makes uh, Akagi's Island so cool is it, it's almost like a like an office building almost. You know, you've got this slab section of island that just goes straight down to the waterline. And Akagi is really tall. Her flight deck is about 65 feet above the water. Uh, the bridge itself is about 100 feet above the water. So, again, the fact that you can recognize this sort of slab-like appearance makes her bridge just unmistakable as far as I'm concerned. All right. Keep going. Yeah, okay, so this is cool, too. Bobbing up, bobbing down. So, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna share a screen here reasonably. So just keep, keep going for, for a little bit here. Let's see where we end up. So we're looking down now on top of her island. There's another shot, though, where they kind of come around the front of it a little bit. And mm -hmm. uh, gives you an idea of how small that island actually is, really. Yeah, it's really not big at all. Why don't you fast forward Vag a little bit? Vaguely, see, there's a kind of a room there, I guess. Oh, yeah, there okay, there we go. All right, let me find you some eye candy here. Do, 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 do. Where do I want? Let's see. Bridge. Collected bridge one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So again, we've got that. We've got the bandstand here in the front of the bridge. There's there's this little uh, platform on the side of the island where there was a searchlight at one time. And you can see that down here. Just a little itty bitty mm -hmm. searchlight. And you can also see right here is the support that held that platform up on the, you know, tapering down yeah. to the to the side of the bridge. So that's pretty neat. Let me also then find you this thing. All right. So what we see is that there's a section of the sort of the trapezoidal front face of this island that has fallen down and landed on top of the stump of the island. This used to be the helmsman's station, okay? We can see the little portholes here uh, where the helmsman, which is just below the level of the bridge itself, would have been stationed. And, um, you know, that's where the, that's where the steering wheel, wheel is, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, and then just abaft that, and this is another thing that um, that that Ed Lowe pointed out, and I, he's right on the money. I think you can see this this section of you know looks like pipe or something snaking up out of of the decking. These are probably her voice tubes. So there would have been a command station just after the helmsman that has all the voice tubes down to the engineering spaces, the magazines, what have you, where commands could be relayed down to those spaces. The bridge level itself would be just above this. It's gone. But what makes this shot so neat, too, is we can really see this bandstand here. And that's sort of dramatic because when Akagi is, is abandoned, uh, or actually when Nagumo is finally convinced that he needs to leave the bridge of the ship because the fires are encroaching, well, oopsie, they find out that actually, yeah, the fires are encroaching to the point that we can no longer escape from this bridge because the the companionway down aft is blocked now by fires. So they end up going out one of the bridge window up here and rappelling down to this bandstand. So they go right past the helmsman station, if you will, and end up down here. Well, Fuchida... Uh, he's in the process of, of doing that. There's an explosion and it knocks him. And apparently he lands on the flight deck down here someplace, ends up breaking both of his ankles. But again, being able to place 
this particular portion of the island and know what happened here. You know, the, the men were on this thing and scrambling to get out of the bridge and, and vacate it as, as they're, you know, getting out of Dodge because the fires are about to consume this particular portion of the ship. And you can see the aftermath of that consummation, if you will. Be cool. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, as you said, there were those things probably being voice tubes. It would explain why they've got less marine growth on them. Uh-huh. Because the voice tubes usually copper or copper alloy, that would be a bit inimical to anything. That's a really good comment. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, mm. you're exactly right. And and Ed has a friend who has dived on a lot of wrecks, and he's like, yeah, those look like voice tubes to me. That's what I see when I see voice tubes on ships. But I just thought that was that was really cool. Mm. And you can do see you that little the... search like, go ahead. I was going to say, do you think the the fact that this sort of the upper part of the island, as you said, has collapsed... Do you think that's when she's hit the bottom because it's a fairly lightweight structure or do you think that was done on the surface by explosions and damage before she sank? Great question. I I couldn't tell you the answer. Um, Mm. Yeah. Hard to say. I suppose that 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 little bit just sitting there probably suggests if there was more of it when it land initially landed. Yeah. Well, yeah, and you it would can be a great that, coincidence if that fell off somewhere up top and just happened to come back to rest again. Yeah, yeah. Pretty cool. But but neat, too, because yeah. you, we don't see this on Kaga. You know, there's nothing left of her bridge structure whatsoever. In fact, there's nothing left of anything really above her armor deck. She is, mm. as you're going to see, she is demolished. Here's that... Uh, a, adorable little uh searchlight stand here kind of bobbing yeah. up and down we can we can see the the support you can also see that along the side of the island is this sort of catwalk so you could actually mm. walk right along the side of the ship um some of the portholes there too that searchlight platform would be a I'm not real keen on heights, and if you're standing on that platform, I mean, you could literally jump 75 feet down to the down to the the ocean right underneath you. Pretty scary. There's something interesting just there at the front line, kind of underneath the bandstand. Yeah, I don't know what that is. Yeah, I don't know. Something. It's just it's just fascinating in all the little details that are still there because yeah, you know, you, we you hear about the the damage that the ship took before she went down. And it's strange that there's half the island is just gone. Right. And yet there's random little bits of cabling and odd bits on the deck that are just still there for whatever reason. Right. And guard railing there too, you could see. Hmm. All right. So now where the heck are we? Oh, they've gone all the way back to the casemates. Um, that's an, actually okay. Let's stop here and let's go backwards because there's a there's a shot of one of her gun tubs, um, on just aft of the island before we get to this point. I'm pretty sure. Keep going back. I think. Yeah, they go to the casemates and then they're going to go to the stern next. Yeah, I think you might just want to manually drag, uh, drag the. Um, the slider back and forth for where we are in the footage. Mm-hmm. I feel like it was before this. Oh, before we look, before we looked at the bridge. Yeah. Okay, let's go back. But yeah. Okay, there was a glimpse of it just there. Actually, the mount. A little forward again. I wish I had, I should have annotated these times. Keep going. I caught just a glimpse of it as you were backing up. Keep going. Well, I have a screen cut. Is that it just there? On the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Okay, there you go. Right. So you can just see right underneath mm-hmm. that. Um, and let me go ahead and and find you. A, there, there's a, a better shot of that. Oh, 
course, I don't have these annotated as well as I would like. Mm -hmm. uh, there we go. Yeah, so at one portion uh, in the footage, we, we can see this. So again, uh, here are some of those portholes. Here's that big office building slab of her, of her bridge heading for the waterline. And then right behind it, this is the forward most of those 120 millimeter gun mounts. What makes this interesting to me is you'll note that this particular mount is still on its pedestal. And so it was, uh, you know, it came down and is still fairly contiguous and undamaged. But anyway, it was kind of kind of neat to see that all of these, the anti-aircraft guns were, were still there on the ship. All right. And it's interesting that this one also is completely missing its shield. Well, they didn't have shields on the on the port side because there was no okay. no flue gases to to worry about. So yeah, they of were course. unshielded. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that sort of betrays the fact that this is an early carrier design is that you'll notice that the the anti-aircraft guns are very low on her uh hull side, which meant mm. that they had very restricted firing arcs and sky arcs. Uh, most of the more recent carriers, you know, they're, those tubs would have been up another deck level so that they had, you know, larger firing arcs. But again, this is a ship that was designed in the, you know, converted in the late 1920s and nobody really knew how a carrier was supposed to be. All right, now we can go and uh, go back to those casemate mounts. There we are. There's mm -hmm. one right there. And that is going to be the forward most of her eight inch uh casemates let me go the ahead lines go ahead. right up to the base isn't it it sure is yeah and you know she's a big heavy ship and uh oh come on now there we go right so here we are uh down towards the stern of akagi and she has on either side she's got three of these eight inch uh 203 millimeter, actually maybe 200 millimeter uh, guns. Because again, at the time that she was designed, first of all, she was a battle cruiser. Second, um, much like Lexington and Saratoga, when they, you know, their initial designs, they they carried eight inch guns on them too, for exactly the same reason. These were ships that were designed to operate as scouts for the main battle line. And it was anticipated that they might end up in situations where they would have to defend themselves against enemy cruisers that might have gotten through the screen uh, for the main battle line. And so it was, you know, it seemed reasonable that they would need to have cruiser scale ar armament to take care of themselves. And that's why they've got these, you know, eight inch guns down on the waterline, which of course by 1942 were just completely useless. But again, a really kind of cool vestige of her battle cruiser heritage here. The other thing you can see is that the superstructure, the hangar deck superstructure is still reasonably contiguous, at least for some vertical amount above that casemate mount. Now, I don't know how far up it goes. It looks like it's, you know, we're at least somewhere in the lower hangar deck. I'm not sure that the gun tubs that are right above that are there. In fact, I'm pretty sure they're not. But Again, as we'll see when we get to Kaga, she's got a lot more of her hull structure still intact um, than, than Kaga does. All right. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd be fascinated to know what the seabed is actually like, like what, what it's made of in this area. Yeah. I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, is this like a really soft, slurry-like seabed where the majority of the hull is actually still down there? Or is this a bit more like... Um, like Bismarck, where basically everything below the armor de armor belt level has been pancaked by the force of the impact. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it could actually could probably find that out relatively mm -hmm. easily. You know, the, one of the cool things about this expedition is that there were hydrogeologists and marine biologists. You know, a lot of people were watching this footage, and if they weren't into you know, Japanese warships that are like, oh, that's a really cool anemone that's, you know, right <laughs> there. Yeah, it was really, it was kind of neat. Anyway, so here we are. Yeah, right down in her casemate. All right. I think you can go forward at this point because now we're going to start getting, um, okay, so stop right there. Oops. Okay. Yeah. This is the extreme 
portion of Akagi's stern. And what we're seeing here with those three little white rectangles mm -hmm. actually painted over her name. So let me show you. Let's see, Akagi stern, port side. There we go. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Come on. Yeah, here we are. So her name was painted right down, you know, next to this porthole that's right here and right underneath the bollard. These are not particularly big characters. I, I think I measured them. They're maybe 18 inches, maybe two feet. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, the Japanese felt the need to paint them over. What makes this fascinating to me is that their destroyers often carried the names of the destroyers on the sides of the ship, but they were much larger kana and would have been recognizable to an enemy at, at least at some distance. But you know, with 18-inch high lettering, man, if you're more than you know a football field away, you're not getting be able to see these things. So I don't know why they felt the need to paint them out, but you can see uh, the three little. Um, Anna here. So hmm. it would read from right to left. It would be A Ka Gi. And you can even see this little rectangle on the side here. That would be for the diacritical um, that turns the key Kana into a Gi. And we're going to get a much better shot of this when we get over to the starboard side of the ship. Uh, so let's yeah, keep it, rolling. It, it does seem a little bit odd to me because, as you said, it's a tiny, tiny thing. And also, Akagi is one of a kind. So yeah. just by her silhouette, you're going to know what she is. It's not like it's Shikaku and Zuikaku, where it might be one or the other. Right, um, right. I mean, right. even here, you and Soryu are going to be more similar than Akagi is right. to anything else. Yeah, so keep going along here. So now hmm. we're on the, uh, the starboard side of the ship, and we're looking at those same kana. And a little bit forward, it's going to actually give us... There we go. Ba-boom. Okay, so... If you look really closely, you can actually sort of see the outlines of where those characters would have been. And this oh, was yeah. one of them, right? And I'm going to show you a screen cap that actually I had to go out and find a character set of Japanese that was reasonably calligraphic because the, the fonts that they're using here are very, uh, they're very rounded and florid almost. Um but this was a, a moment in the expedition when I'm sitting here looking at my monitor and seeing this. And there's a woman in Japan in her kitchen. She was one of the expedition team, too. And she had her mom there. And they, too, are looking at these characters. And it was literally at this point when we could see the tracery of the Ah character on the front. When both she and her mom and I were just like, squee, <laughs> you know, it's clear. <laughs> what this ship is so let me show you here um ba -doo, ba -doo, ba -doo. you can see the porthole next to them as well these are yes. not big letters in any way shape no they're or not way. right so here's my you know my attempt uh, and unfortunately this font is is deliberately weathered as well but you can see in black here this is basically how those fonts would have laid down and again this little rectangle here, which would cover the diacritical turn gi or key into gi, it 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 just was really cool uh, from my standpoint to be able to you know recognize those those kana. Anyway, all righty. A lot of speculation as to what this little trough is that's right above mm -hmm. uh, the characters. You know, we don't really know. And yeah, as you can see, too, the mud line is just right up on, you know, it's probably no more than five, six feet uh, to the deck yeah. here. Yeah. Anyway. This trough is a mysterious old thing. It looks yeah. like there's a little yeah. bit of sea, I guess, the marine snowfall on the deck there. Yes. One of the things they don't show on this footage is that there's um, a, a round feature on the the. the the boat deck there we were trying to figure out what the heck it was it seems to be just a support but uh, this is a substantial feature it's probably like i don't know 15 20 feet uh across and uh yeah a lot of people were trying to figure out where that was coming from anyway 
This is basically the footage that we have now of Akagi. You can fast forward. I'm trying to think. I think they went back to the bow again. I don't know what that is. Something broken. <laughs> yeah, something broken. <laughs> yeah, pithy summation. Very murky water. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, so well, this is this is one of the hazards, isn't it? If the water's yes. nice and clear until something gets disturbed, and then it doesn't right. matter how and, much light you've got. And then you know this kind of sticky outy stuff that's down here uh, in the bottom of your screen. That's what they want not to be running into with an ROV. Okay, uh, this is a neat feature. We're now back at the extreme stern. I didn't even know that Akagi had a stern anchor, but she sure as hell does because you know here it is lying it is. in the mud. <laughs> Yeah, right underneath the stern of the ship. And again, you can see the, the very slender lines uh, of her stern itself. Uh, she's, a, she's a very racy, a very racy animal. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, that sort of wraps up Akagi, I think. So if you enjoyed this look at what very recent underwater archaeology looks like in the terms of the Midway wrecks, then tune in in a couple of weeks' time to the next Fun Friday, where we'll be heading down again to have a look at Carga and Yorktown, the other two wrecks that have been surveyed very recently, as we mentioned at the start of this video. And hopefully you've enjoyed this little look at what's left of Akagi. Nonetheless, thanks very much for watching. See you again in another video.